everybody, welcome to this new series on game design called Designing the Game. Uh, it's not a clever title, but it is accurate. I just, uh, I read through the finished script and I wanna say here at the beginning that I was so excited to share this process with you folks because I think it's gonna be really interesting and make good videos that I sort of forgot to talk about how excited I am about the actual game. I am really excited about this game. I think it's gonna be not revolutionary. We're not trying to invent new mechanics just to be clever, but I think it is going to be really fun. Fun to run, fun to play, and fun to design for. But who knows where we'll end up. It could be we do all this work and no one cares. But if nothing else, we will have done our best and you will get to watch the whole thing come together or fall apart. That doesn't seem likely, but the future is uncertain. Anyway, on with the video. You probably already know we're working on our own original tabletop RPG right now, but we're not really in production yet. We're still in R&D. We're mostly still focused on Arcadia and Flea Mortals and the talent that is back in production. And we're completely overhauling the ill rigor to bring it in line with all the rest of our design. And all of those projects are gonna wrap up pretty soon. And then we are full time on the RPG. In spite of all that other work getting in the way, we have made what I consider to be a lot of progress. We do play tests every other week or so, and the game has evolved quite a bit since we started working on it. It's really exciting to see it all come together. And we're documenting this entire experience basically live on our Patreon. These videos can't really capture all the minutia involved in game dev. So if you wanna see all the gory details and see all the dead ends we went down, Head over to the Patreon, it is eight bucks a month, which depending on your situation, that can be a lot, but that's what these videos are for. This is the free version. And at some point, probably this year, the patrons will get to play the game. We also do live streams for patrons where folks get to ask questions of the team. The patrons get to see all the new art in development, which if you saw Flea Mortals, you know the art is half the fun of these things. I personally can't wait to see the team's take on MCDM Dwarves coming soon. So. All that is on the Patreon. Right now it's just dev diaries, but as more of the game starts coming online, you'll get art and eventually the actual playable rules. If you don't got eight bucks a month, don't sweat it. You got these videos. So let's get started. This first video is gonna be relatively short, but it's super important. I wanna talk about how we made so much progress so quickly. Part of it is we're experienced developers. We've developed new RPGs before, so we know it can be done and the problem doesn't intimidate us. The stakes are intimidating, <laughs> but the process is not particularly terrifying. That's a big deal, just knowing it can be done. Don't panic. All big creative collaborative projects like this, doesn't matter if it's an RPG or a war game or a video game or an album or a movie, they all work the same way. You know what the finished product should look like, right? We're not inventing some new technology where no one knows where it might lead, but the finished product might be Huge. Even a TTRPG, it's not as complex as a video game, but it's, it's still pretty complicated. This is our flagship product. It is intended to be as robust as the game you're already playing, which means it needs to cover a lot of ground and that can be intimidating. Not all RPGs are like this. Some are only one page long, but that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make a game where the director or the players can model all kinds of stories and conflicts and drama, and that is a lot of work. Just the core rules might be 800 pages long. So the trick is to just chop it up into a million tiny pieces, focus on one piece at a time and not freak out at how big the problem is. Not freaking out is a lot easier if you've done this before and you know it can be done. Yeah, we're only focusing on this one tiny problem today and we have 700 more to do, but we'll get there. It's just one problem at a time, it'll happen. This is not about how smart we are or anything like that. It's just about experience and not being intimidated by how big the problem set is. So that's one reason we feel good about where we are right now. If you're watching this and you're looking at your five e-core books thinking, that's a lot of work. How do you not get overwhelmed? Well, that's the same way you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Another reason we didn't freak out at how massive the scope of the project is, we started off with a clearly defined goal, defined using keywords, and that is basically what this video is about. You could think of these as a kind of brand statement. We started by talking about what we wanted this game to be. Uh, we don't wanna support every play style a little and end up making no one happy. So the question was, what is this game about? What would we like to see? What do we think is fun? Well, we like dungeon crawling, but I think the best version of a dungeon crawler is dark fantasy, survival horror, and that is super fun, but it's a little narrow for what we wanted this game to be. 
We like exploration, wilderness survival, hex crawl stuff, but I also think that's more narrow than what we wanted. Those fantasies deserve their own games. I would love it if MCDM eventually made lots of games, but for this flagship RPG, we wanted something with broad appeal that supports all the stuff you see in like the, the Chain of Acheron or Dusk or my earlier sandbox games. Those are all very different campaigns using different systems, but our games should support all of them. So we settled on four keywords that narrow the scope of the problem, but are still broad enough to have mass appeal, we think. By identifying what this game is, or what we want it to be, and what it is not, it's not a hex crawler or a dungeon crawler, we're able to spend our time on design that supports those goals, rather than trying to just do everything, which really would be overwhelming. The keywords we came up with are tactical, cinematic, heroic, fantasy. Not in that order, not in any order, they're all important, so let's talk about what they mean, starting with heroic. Obviously, heroic means different things to different people. That's why we're making this video, so you know what we mean when we say heroic in this context. For us, it means a couple of things. First, and maybe most importantly, it means we do not assume your character is primarily motivated by greed. In a dungeon crawler? Well, why else are you risking life and limb down there? Probably because that's where the loot is. So in a dungeon crawler, greed, for lack of a better word, is good. But for our game, we assume your character is primarily motivated to do the right thing. Save the, well, eventually the world. <laughs> Maybe right now, you're only first level, you're just trying to save the blacksmith's daughter. I think I watched a video about that a while ago. But eventually, as you level up, the stakes increase until, yeah, you might be called upon to save the literal world. If we do a good job, you'll be able to run lots of different kinds of campaigns in the system, including adventures with no villain, or where the heroes are all evil but we do not assume the heroes are primarily selfish. So that's one definition of heroic. It's not a game about murder hobos wandering the land, killing anyone they meet, and rifling through their pockets. Adventures are mostly going to be about villains who threaten people and your quest to stop them. And I think this is what most people playing fantasy RPGs these days expect. It means there are no mechanics in this game that reward you for getting gold, for instance. Your character might decide that they are adventuring for the money, but that's probably because money is going to help solve some bad situation your character wants to get out of. Gold is a means to an end in this game, not an end unto itself. It's not your score. You can still absolutely play a Raceland type character who is basically evil and driven to do bad things in their quest for ultimate knowledge, or a Care Avon who's only in it for himself, but we do not assume all characters are amoral. Our baseline assumption is that most PCs want to do the right thing most of the time, and when there's an exception, it's because that exception is cool and creates drama. It would be really cool to see folks use this system to run a Chain of Acheron style game where the heroes are all dark fantasy mercenaries. The Chain are not good guys. The hard-bitten soldiers of the Chain take their pay and do what they must, burying their doubts with their dead. But even the chain is not in it primarily for the money. None of those characters you saw were greedy. They still had a code. They sign up because doing so gives them purpose and a sense of camaraderie, not for greed or loot. So that's one component of the heroic keyword. It's about motivation. But another component, equally important, is what kinds of things happen on screen, so to speak. This is very closely related to the cinematic keyword. For instance, you never see Indiana Jones having to find a local sporting goods store because he needs to stock up on ammo. You never see Luke Skywalker have to stop and take a sh shower because he stinks. These things happen. No one watching Raiders of the Lost Ark thinks that Indy's gun is magical and doesn't need bullets. We just don't need to see Indy do that stuff. We don't need to waste time on it. Likewise, in our game, we don't worry about stuff that heroes in fiction tend not to worry about. We don't track ammunition. We don't worry about how much everything you're carrying weighs. If you try to lift a bear, you might get the encumbered condition, sure, but nowhere on your character sheet are you tracking the weight of every item in ounces and pounds. You don't track food, like rations. You don't worry about how many torches you got. That's not what this game is about. It's not what your character's story is about. That stuff is appropriate to some games, Games we like, but not this game. So those are two really important ways in which we view our game as heroic. It's about your character's motivation. We don't assume that you are automatically good and self-sacrificing, but the baseline assumption is most characters in most groups are going to accept the quest because it's the right thing to do. 
and it's about what happens on screen. Bows still use arrows, but Legolas doesn't tell everyone we have to stop and go to the Bass Pro Shop to buy more arrows. Characters might need torches, sure, but the game is not about tracking torches or worrying about how far the light goes. Uh, none of these terms are scientific. There's no unit of measurement for heroic or cinematic. They're just broad ideas that we find useful. The second key word is cinematic, and that's tricky because different people mean different things by that. There are cinematic RPGs that explicitly try to model the structure of movies, usually action movies. One of the Star Trek RPGs I worked on, the designers made sure the game heavily featured the rules of Star Trek episodes, including the scene before the opening credits that sets up the central tension and the five act model that you see everywhere in hour long TV dramas. So that's one way a game can be cinematic. It can literally design mechanics around the tools of cinematic storytelling. And while we've talked about using a scene system that would let directors build adventures more easily just by combining different kinds of scenes, I don't know where that's gonna land, and it's not core, it's just a cool idea we tossed around. Instead, when we say cinematic, we mean visual. When you read how your abilities work, you can picture your character doing these things, and your class abilities encourage the kind of over-the-top theatrical heroics you see in action movies. For me, the best example of this is from Dusk, the 4E game I ran where my friend Matt O'Driscoll's dragonborn paladin, Sir Vanazor, in a moment of desperation, YOLO'd himself off of a tree onto a goblin war spider platform with like 12 goblins on it and critted. We could all very vividly picture Sir Vanazor leaping across the gap, possibly to his death, in an attempt to single-handedly take on an entire unit of light goblin infantry and their pet war spider. It was visual. It was cinematic. It even had slow motion, right? As the dragon man hurls himself through the air, his great sword held high above his head, ready to slam into a dozen goblins. Probably had a Carpenter Brute soundtrack. That's what we want. That's what we mean by cinematic. There's no mechanics attached to this. It's more of an approach to class design. Focusing on fantasies that have a strong visual component, special abilities that are dramatic and evocative, so that when you read them, you can see your character doing it, and it looks, in your head, like a movie. That's what we mean when we say role-playing in 70 millimeter. It's not a game mechanic, it's a vibe. It's an approach to class design. Now, you might think, well, that's not what cinematic means to me, but hopefully it's obvious that that's not the point. These are the terms we use to guide development. Keywords that let us focus in on one kind of experience. And if we have two options that are otherwise the same, we can say, well, which is more cinematic? And that has value. Maybe you would use different terms for your game. That is awesome. Knock yourself out. The third keyword is tactical. And I'm not sure I need to explain this, but it mostly means positioning matters. The game is played on a grid and you have multiple mechanical options on your turn that give you different ways to achieve your party's strategic goals. And here we are mostly talking about fighting monsters. Our game is not only about fighting monsters, but when you do fight monsters, we want it to actually feel like you are playing a fun game, not just narrating your way through a fun encounter. That's why the game explicitly uses a grid. We measure things in squares, not feet or meters. There's rules for how big a square is, but usually you're not thinking in those terms. Your character sheet says that you have six movement. That means you can move six squares. Done. We use squares because it makes it clear to everyone we are playing a game, but ideally not a tedious game, a fun game where planning and teamwork matter. That is super important to us, teamwork matters. Our whole initiative system is designed around encouraging teamwork. I know there are folks who associate playing on the grid as a modern convention, meaning like third edition or later, but I started in 1985 with AD&D and we used a grid. Almost every group in our area did. It is by no means a new idea. Lots of people like theater of the mind, we like the grid. Some folks assume that tactical is like the opposite of cinematic, but I think that's because they associate cinematic with hand-waving a lot of stuff. But that's not how we use that term. For us, there is no conflict between cinematic and tactical. The last keyword probably requires the least explanation. Fantasy. I, I really miss science fiction, I'm not gonna lie. But I love fantasy. This is maybe the easiest keyword to explain. It just means there's spells and dragons and stuff. And while in our world building, we take fantasy very seriously, sort of our whole thing is really thinking about why things are the way they are in the fantasy world, but our game is not about hard science or laws of physics. And these days, I view a lot of what folks call science fiction as basically fantasy. All that 70s retro future stuff, which I love, is now very obviously fantasy to me, not science. 
John Berkey spaceships could not exist. They are pure fantasy, and that is why I love them. So while our game might stretch the definition of fantasy to include things like the operator, that's right, and the timescape, I think that all still counts. You're not going to get pulse rifles or colonial marines, for instance. I don't think anybody has a six gun. Those are our four keywords, and hopefully you have a clear idea what we're going for. Your character is probably motivated to do the right thing. We don't worry about stuff like ammunition or rations. It's played on a grid. Positioning matters. Teamwork matters. Your class and their abilities have a strong visual component to them, and that visual component evokes a certain kind of classic action movie. And there's dragons and wizards and stuff in. Maybe it's not obvious how these things help us narrow the scope of this project, but they helped us enormously. Knowing what the game is not also helped. It's not a dungeon crawler, even though I'm sure lots of adventures will feature dungeons. They're just another classic location for encounters. The game is not about surviving in a dungeon. It's also not based on any other game. Uh, this is an important point in this day and age. Yes, we are basically trying to compete with D&D. Sure. That's not a thing we can really do from a production standpoint. We are a very tiny company. You know, if we get 50,000 people to play this game, that would be an enormous success compared to something like a few million people playing D&D. We'll never get anywhere near there. But we're not starting by forking some earlier edition. This isn't a 5E clone or a 3E clone or even a 4E clone. Even though we really liked 4th edition, our game is already super different. I think if you liked 4th, if, if you liked Dusk, you will see a lot of what you liked in our game. But it's mostly just having similar keywords like tactical and heroic. Another big reason, I could do a whole video on this, another big reason we made a lot of progress really quickly is rapid prototyping. This is something I learned on the last video game I worked on. It is super important. There's sort of two ways to tackle a project like this. Maybe the most obvious way, feels very straightforward, but I do not think it is actually useful, is by starting with an outline. Uh, now, that might not seem obvious to you. You might think, great, but how do I write an outline? Uh, and if this were a novel, I would sympathize. But if you are a normal gaming nerd, and you are, you probably have an entire bookcase full of RPG outlines, you just don't know it. Here, let's take a look at the outline for 5th edition. It's literally the table of contents. Every RPG on your shelf has one of these, and if you decided to design and publish your own RPG, well, starting by choosing some existing game that is sort of close to what you're thinking about, and then just tweaking the table of contents so it covers what you want to make, is a perfectly legitimate process. You can also do stuff like count the number of words per line until you get a good average, then multiply by the number of lines on a page, see how big the book is, meaning how many pages, and now you can figure out your word count. That's useful, especially if this is your first time designing a game from scratch. You could look at how much art did the game have? How big was that art? How many artists worked on it? Are they on ArtStation? How much do they cost? You could learn a lot of really useful stuff just by finding some product, some RPG, that's sort of in the ballpark of what you want to do and seeing how they did it. Then, and, I, and I've worked on games like this, then you could just start writing design docs. Every single entry on this table of contents, you could just write your version of that chapter, the whole thing from start to finish. Just create an enormous number of design docs. <laughs> Producers tend to favor this approach because it lends itself well to checklists. You're basically starting by making a list of every single thing you need to do to finish the game. Looks very organized, but I'm not sure I've ever seen this process actually work. Best you can do is make that list, then get started and discover that the list was actually kind of useless because game dev doesn't really work that way and you spend most of your project fighting with and revising and ultimately ignoring those design docs. I've worked on projects where the first thing we did was we wrote dozens of design docs, and what happened was they were almost all completely obsolete by the time we actually started implementing them. Because as soon as a design doc is done, someone on the team has a conversation about it, they decide to tweak that design, and now your document is stale. No matter how dedicated you are, no team in the history of game dev has started this way and kept all their design docs up to date through the entire project. Because... At the end of the day, the design lives in the heads of the team, not in Google Docs. Every time the designers talk, the design changes. That is very tiresome. Instead, what does work is focusing on your core gameplay loop and implementing something now, as soon as possible, as quick and dirty as you can make it, that sort of simulates what you're going for, and then actually test that. By which I mean, play it. 
Just bypass the design doc and go straight to implementation and testing. For us, this meant we had kicked around some vague ideas about the scope and keywords for a few months last year, because we were pretty sure we were going to start working on this game sometime in 2023. But then, in early January, we flew all the designers out to Southern California, we spent one day in meetings talking about all this, and on the second day, we were playing our game. James prototyped some characters and monsters, and we made our own dice by writing on gaffer's tape that we had stuck on normal dice, and then we started testing our ideas. We'll go into exactly how we did all this in another video, but all we've done so far is design the things that we need to design to test that core gameplay loop, the basic fighting monsters loop. At one point, James and I were talking about prototyping some skills because we were ready for that. And he said, I, I guess this is how we get this game done. He meant, is the outline the last thing we're going to write? Or are we just going to keep prototyping new chunks, iterating on them until they seem stable and then just add another chunk? Well, sort of, yeah. It'll be more complicated than that. At some point, we'll have a couple of real classes designed out all the way from levels 1 to 10, which I think is our level cap. And then we may start bringing other designers that we've worked with on to help us with other classes so that suddenly there's a lot of people all building out this game. And at that point, we will need an outline. But until then, we just discover we need some mechanic, like skills, so we prototype the skills. That creates... It means you start by making sure the game is fun to play. That's what this is all about. Forget the outline, forget rules for resting, skills, rules for advancement, an experience or encounter design. Let's just make some goblins and some first level PCs as bare bones as possible and start playing. Implement our original design. See if it's fun. Then keep tweaking it until it's really fun. Then slowly add new features, constantly testing, polishing, making sure that's fun before you add the next bit. It really helps everybody concentrate on what is important. Play, fun, clarity, ease of use, all that. We think we got the core encounter loop worked out in these days when we test, we expand to three encounters at a time. How does that feel? I, I could keep talking about this until eventually this is a six hour long video that explains everything we've done since January, but this is a good place to stop. We will talk more about rapid prototyping in another video, but this is certainly enough for folks to think about. Remember, no matter how big the problem, don't panic. Other people have done what you're going to do. It can be done. Just break it into small, manageable chunks and start chipping away at it. Eventually, you will look back and be surprised at how much progress you made. Make sure you understand what your game is and what it's not. Good keywords are like a brand statement. They help everyone on the project decide if we have two options, all other things being equal, which fits our keywords better. Finally, don't bother trying to design the entire game on paper first. You could do that. You got lots of examples sitting on your bookshelf. Better to start by actually playing your design, even if most of it is just temp stuff that you kludged together so that you had something to work with. But focus on, is it fun? Are your ideas going to survive actual play? Only work on the stuff you need to work on to get to the table and actually start playing. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this first designing the game video. I really hope this series kind of turns into something. I would love to get a whole bunch of people watching to start thinking like game designers. I realize we didn't spend any time talking about mechanics, but it was important to me that we talk about how we actually got started. That We really did have these discussions about these keywords. Next video, we're going to talk about what happened in literally like the first 48 hours of playtesting our game back in January and the things we discovered and the design that we implemented based on it. I know it's very unlikely that you're ever going to design your own RPG from scratch, especially the way we're doing it, but I just think this process is interesting. It is amazingly cool that we get to do this and we are dying to share it with you. I mentioned this in our announcement video on my personal channel, but I was a full-time tabletop designer back in the 1900s. And back then, I, I really thought I was eventually going to produce my own original RPG from scratch, single-handedly. Well, I've worked on a couple of books where I was the only writer designer, and I am here to tell you it is a miserable experience. For me, at least. In 2003, I left tabletop for video games, and I had some intensely rewarding, also nightmares, but mostly rewarding experiences in video games because they were collaborative. Writing, which is most of TTRPG design, is a very solitary profession. Ask any freelancer. But video games are wildly multidisciplinary projects where, especially as a designer, I was working with a team of smart people every day hashing out how systems or missions would work and regularly talking with animators, programmers, concept artists, character modelers. It was awesome. 
So I no longer have that fantasy of what I used to call a big ego project, meaning an ambitious, self-contained RPG with my name on the cover, telling everyone, not only did I write this, it represents my philosophies. I no longer value that idea. I value teamwork and collaboration. So whatever this game turns out to be, it's not going to be my design. Uh, uh. It is MCDM design. A lot of people are going to have their fingerprints on this game by the time it is all said and done. And mostly what we do in meetings is solve problems on the spot. None of us are bringing some existing design or some manuscript we wrote before, some prototype we worked on years ago to the table. Nope, we are all inventing this game as we go. And we are happy to have you along for the ride. Thanks for watching, folks. Until next time, peace out.